real smooth. So yeah, this is our first one, and um, I'm very, very happy that somebody agreed to be uh, my guinea pig for uh, the first ever attempt at doing this. We're, we're on a magical learning journey here for how to do these types of line events. So thank you all for coming along and bearing through the technical difficulties. So you may be new to Sustainable UX, or you might be a past conference attendee, and either way, you might be wondering what's going on. A uh, quick little bit of background, Sustainable UX uh, is and was an online virtual conference. Uh, set up in 2016 by myself and Jennifer Brazelli. We were trying to find a way to help climate concerned designers do something about the climate crisis. Uh, so we put on a conference and we've run around four annual live virtual events. But this year we're taking a break, trying something different with a series of one on one talks uh, with people who work in this space. Um, mostly to boost up the, the level of audience participation. Uh, running a conference was a lot of fun and also a lot of stress, but because uh, we had so many speakers and uh, so much success attracting speakers, there was never much space for discussion or Q&A. And that was the number one uh, question I got from attendees was, how can we take part more? So hence this live series uh, with uh, a much more of a Q&A aspect to it. Anyway, that's way enough backstory for something like that. Um, that's not why you're here, you're here today for Amy Buker. Amy Buker is our first guest to try out this new format. So thanks very much to her for, for bearing with us. I'm gonna do a, a, a little bit of bio here. Amy Buker, PhD, is the very president of behavior change design at MadPow, which is a purpose-driven strategic design agency in Boston. Amy focuses on crafting engaging and motivating experiences that help people change behaviors that contribute to physical, mental, and financial health and well-being. Amy has worked on behavior change in-house at CVS Health and at Johnson & Johnson. So I met Amy back in 2016 and uh, didn't waste any time inviting her on to Sustainable UX as one of our earlier speakers. She's now spoken twice and her talks are consistently amongst our most popular and most best talks that we've had. Um, so thank you very much for, for uh, continuing, you know, this is like your third year coming in and propping up our show. So thank you for that. Um, so I've been lucky also enough to work with some with Amy on a few projects. So I'm lucky enough to call her both a colleague, a friend, a mentor, and the good kind of enabler. Um, and the bad kind of enabler sometimes, but mostly the good kind. Hi, Amy. Hi. There's, there's Amy. So uh, what's, what's going on with you? What's up? Um, oh, boy. Well, I'm living through a global pandemic, which wasn't something I was expecting to have to do. But here we are. Um, yeah. Before that, one thing that I did very recently, and I think is part of the reason why I'm here today, is I wrote a book about behavior change and how designers can use psychology to create products and experiences that really help people change their behavior, that they're, um, you know, engaged in. The, the book is called Engaged, and I chose that title because the way that I approach behavior change is about understanding what motivates people and trying to align behaviors to that. So uh, it's a Rosenfeld Media book. It came out on March 3rd, so probably poor timing in terms of, of um, you know, fo focusing on it and, and getting to talk about it. But I actually think that it's probably more relevant than ever. So that's, that, I guess, is a, a good thing. And, um, yeah, um, beyond that, you know, one thing that you and I both share an interest in and one of the reasons why I was excited to get involved with Sustainable UX when I first learned about it years ago is that I do care very deeply about climate change and sustainability behaviors and trying to figure out with those behaviors in particular, there's such a disconnect between the impact that they can have and your immediate experience because, um, you know, climate change is going to require effort from everyone at your individual efforts are not necessarily going to produce an observable result. And the results of those collective efforts are still pretty abstract and sometimes far in the future. So it's, it's this conundrum of how do we get people to change behaviors, to give up ways of being that are working for them in order to achieve this long-term outcome that really isn't tangible to them. It's, it's like all of the ingredients of good behavior change are complicated when it comes to this particular issue. So it's a particularly hard one to work on, but I think also a really worthwhile one. So we have that shared interest and it was really exciting to me to start to work with people who, who care about that stuff and who were making an effort to make it part of the way that we do our work. So 
um, yeah, that, that was always something I've really enjoyed about this particular series. Well, fantastic. And thank you very much again for, for contributing not one but two uh, excellent talks uh, over the years. Um, I encourage folks to check that out on the Sustainable UX website. Uh, we have the uh, planet. Uh, hang on, I've got the title up here. Planet is patient to conserve what uh, conservation you've learned from health psychology. So that was your first talk applying these ideas uh, into the climate movement. And I believe you were then able to sort of take that and develop that further with other organizations like the WWF um, mm -hmm. to, 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 to enable environmental nonprofits to start thinking in these terms. And then uh, you did a talk, uh, I think, last year, which I found particularly helpful, and I keep going back to, which was the how to keep going um, in these exhausting times. So it's a sort of self-motivation talk uh, and the theory of motivation and, and how I, something I run into talking to climate activist type people all the time is just fatigue and occasional lapses of, of morale. Um, and so if that's something that uh, folks listening ever experience, definitely recommend checking out Amy's second talk at Sustainable UX around that. So Amy, I believe you've got a few, uh, a few thoughts you wanted to share with us today in slide form. So what I was planning on doing here is uh, having you present just a little bit and then we can open things up um, on Slack for, for more of a Q&A type thing. Does that sound good? That sounds great. And um, okay. I'm absolutely open as well. I'll try to keep an eye on the questions, but also if you have questions while I'm going through this, this is not a polished presentation. When we first started to talk about this a few, I think it was a few months ago, not even a few weeks ago, the world looked a little different, and this was going to be a fairly straightforward, almost book talk, I think, but um, in light of how much our lives have changed over the last few weeks, I really wanted to um, wrestle with that a little bit, and I, I don't have pat answers, but it's just some of the stuff that I've been thinking about that um, fits in with design psychology and um, you know the way the way that I do my work. So it's you're, you're not um, ruining a TED type talk flow if you have questions midway. Um, and I, I'm really hoping that we can have some conversation about this because I'm I'm looking for input and help in thinking about these things as well. Yeah, and and folks just just joining us uh, to let you know we're mostly monitoring Slack for kind of questions and comments and so on. Um, so. Uh, just go ahead and ignore the, the crummy WebEx chat. Uh, Slack is where it is at. All right, so let's Take see uh, how this works. All right, it does work, great. So um, I, I called this behavior change, social responsibility and motivation, where are we going? And as I said, this is really um, my attempt to use my professional frameworks to make sense of the world that I'm living in right now and some of the challenges that I think we collectively have ahead of us in the coming years, um, and maybe more than years. So I just want to start by grounding in the psychology of motivation and the way that I think about motivation, because it's, it's the basis on which the rest of this rests. But um, I use a theory most frequently called self-determination theory. And if you have ever taken an intro psych course, I guarantee that you've seen parts of this theory because it's um, over 40 years old, has a really robust body of research in support of it, DC and Ryan are two names that people are often familiar with, even if they don't have a lot of psychology experience. Uh, they are the fathers of this theory. So one of the things that self-determination theory does a little bit differently from older theories of motivation is it doesn't just think about it as being high and low, but it also thinks about what is its quality. And motivational quality is determined by the source of that motivation. So what you see on the slide here, um, and this I, I use this particular visual a lot. So if you are not able to see the slides, I know some people were saying they're doing audio only. This, um, you can find this on my website, or if you just Google my name in self-determination theory, or it's in versions of this or in many of the papers from the theory. But the idea is that there are some sources of motivation that are what we call controls. They come from outside of a person. And so that might be no motivation at all. That's someone who has no interest in doing something. Or it might be external motivation where someone is telling you you have to do something. That's sometimes also extrinsic motivation. There could be a reward on the line or a punishment on the line that's causing you to do something. And then there's introjected, which is a little bit closer to internal, but that's just where you have um, the shoulds. Somebody who has introjected motivation is probably using the word should a lot. I know I should do this. 
And there doesn't often tend to be um, great enthusiasm about that because it's not something that's coming from within. Further along the continuum, you have several types of motivation that are what we call autonomous. They come from inside the person. They align with things that the person already values and cares about and the way that they think about themselves. So we have identified where a behavior helps support goals the person has and cares about, integrated where they have that sense of identity. I'm the type of person who does this behavior, and so I'm going to do it because this is who I am. And then intrinsic motivation is another term people are often familiar with, and it's just when something feels good in and of its own accord. So I'm looking at this, at this now, and I'm thinking about the events of the last couple of weeks, and um, I hope some of you are also already starting to see some connections. I'll get into it in a little bit more specifics. When we design for behavior change, one of the things that we try to do is connect the behaviors that we're asking people to do with these autonomous forms of motivation. So we're trying to figure out what are the goals people have? What do they value? Who are they? How do they think of themselves? And how can we contextualize those behaviors in a way that aligns with that? We can also design experiences that help support people in the behavior by fulfilling basic psychological needs. And so that's the second bit of the theory here that I'm going to show. There's three things that everybody, and, and truly everybody, they've done this research cross-culturally, they've done it with different age groups, people who are in very different life circumstances, and these three things hold true for everybody. We all have an, in, an inbred need, an in, innate need for autonomy, and that's making your own meaningful choices, having some control over your own course, your own life. There's competence, so we all need to have evidence in the world that we're successful at the things that we do, that our actions are having an effect. And that often does look like learning or growing. And relatedness is we are not solitary creatures. We need to feel like we belong to something bigger than ourselves. And so that might be the personal relationships that we have. And it might be something that's a little bit more abstract, like feeling like we're part of a community. So when we design experiences that support these three things, people are more likely to continue to engage in them because they're in and of themselves fulfilling their basic needs. And these types of experiences are more likely to help draw that alignment between the behavior and those values or goals, the things that are, are intrinsically motivating to people. So I'm always looking for opportunities to build these three elements into anything that I work on. So I wrote a book, and one of the reasons I wrote a book is there, um, although that theory, self-determination theory, is very well researched and very well published on, there weren't a lot of guides to using it for people who are more in the design field. It's really popular among people who are psychologists or behavior change specialists or social scientists, but it's so relevant to the world of people who are coming from the other side who are researchers or designers, um, you know, who are really crafting these products and experiences. And I wanted to make sure that this information was accessible to that group who, um, you know, they can definitely use it. And I, in my professional experience, I've seen a lot of interest there as well. Um, the book is actually intended for people who don't have a lot of psychology background. I tried to make everything very accessible to people who maybe have never taken a psychology course, but who recognize that there's some value there. And my goals with it were to make it actionable, fun, and accessible. Um, that what I didn't intend, and I mentioned this before, is for it to be so immediately relevant to current events. And I also want to point out, I've had several people say, oh, the cover looks like coronavirus. Um, it's supposed to be kaleidoscopes. It's a metaphor for change. Very unintentional for it to have any resemblance to a virus. And, um, you, you know, I, I wish the timing of it were a little bit different. But as I said before, too, I also think that thinking about motivation may be especially relevant right now because we are asking people to dramatically, dramatically change their behaviors. And the consequences of not doing so are, are huge. So, I think the more that people can have behavior change tools in hand as they approach this problem, the better off we'll be. So a quick recap of the world this week. And um, I was joking with James earlier in the week that when I was first starting to put this together, I was coming from kind of a place of despair. And I was, I was joking, like, is it OK if I just depress everybody? <laughs> I've, I've come around a little bit. But earlier this week, so um, we all know coronavirus has become you know, it's, it's global and it's become a really serious thing that I think pretty much everywhere in the world is now paying attention to. And we are, uh, you know, seeing a lot of changes in our communities where I live in Boston. Um, you know, there's no more restaurant service. Um, most of most of the office buildings are having people work from home or not work at all. Um, if you go outside, you don't really see people. 
So very, very dramatic changes. And we've known in the United States broadly for at least a week or so that we were going to need to make some of these adjustments in order to stop the transmission of the disease. So this is the headline from uh, the Boston Sunday Globe this last Sunday, March 15th. And you can see that all of the headlines on the front page are about coronavirus. And some of the things that had already happened by March 15th were, um, you know, major conferences, including South by Southwest, were canceled. And uh, those of you who are familiar with South by know that that was huge because the entire city of Austin basically, uh, you know, they, they rely on that economically for a lot of um, their year-long success. Um, the NBA, the NHL, and MLB have all put their seasons on hiatus, as well as other professional sports events. Um, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson had announced that they'd received their positive test results, and you know they're they're very well known and very well loved celebrities. So I think that was something that really most people were aware of. The Boston Marathon was postponed until September. It's the first time in over 125 years that it's ever been postponed. And in Boston and other cities, the St. Patrick's Day breakfast and parade were canceled. And in several cities in the U.S., including Boston, that's a very big deal because it's, um, it's just a big old party day. And, um, you know, very, very popular. And again, it drives a lot of revenue for the businesses in town. So it's not something that they easily give up. It's, it's a big sacrifice from an economic perspective. So all of this was happening on Sunday. The other thing that was happening on Sunday, this is a photograph from, or sorry, this is Saturday. This is a photograph from South Boston, which is the neighborhood in Boston where that St. Patrick's Day parade typically takes place. And this is the line of people standing outside a bar to get in. And there's photographs from the rest of the day as well of the same bar that shows that this line maintained all the way through the late evening. Um, bars, pubs, and it wasn't just Boston, but just cram packed full of people, um, really not practicing anything close to social distancing, not even in line and certainly not inside the bar. So in spite of all of this information that was out there, everything that we already knew on that day, um, you have people who are, are very openly behaving in a different way than we would have them behave. And again, with those far-reaching consequences that um, maybe don't feel real yet, but ultimately will be. I see a lot of parallels here to what we're dealing with with climate change and in the sense that we're asking people to make personal changes for something that maybe they feel doesn't affect them that much. It doesn't affect them that much right now. Um, I have heard people, especially people who are, um, you know, a generation older than me say, you know, I'm not going to be around for those effects of climate change. Why do I care? And I think you're hearing a similar sort of rhetoric with some of the people who are out in, you know, bars and restaurants and living their normal lives who are saying, well, you know, I'll recover if I get sick. So why do I care? And what both parties are not thinking about are the others who are affected by their actions. And that is a really hard thing to get people to think about. So why did this happen? Um, I think that the request to self-isolate threatened people's basic psychological needs. It gets in the way of those three things that people are trying to achieve in the way that they live their lives. The things that, it, it's not just a, a goal, it's something that we truly do need. So I think that the disruption of that is part of the reason why people are really struggling to do the things that they need to do. And I also think, again, that the instruction to come down from on high without the consequences being really real, they still, even still now, a week later, feel abstract to a lot of people. I think that makes it really hard as well. Um, but it is a public health necessity. And we have seen other situations where public health has been able to make, at first, unpopular changes to the environment that have ultimately resulted in wide-scale behavior change and that people have found ways to live within. And so the example I have here is um, smoking. And smoking cessation, I think, is it's not quite the same thing, but it's one of the better parallels I can think of in terms of a public health response that limits individual choice in their behavior, but ultimately becomes aligned with what people want to do. So if you think about smoking, in 1964, the Surgeon General of the United States put out their first report on the effects of cigarettes on health. And prior to that, it was one of those things where um, you know, some people knew that it wasn't good for, for health, but um, there was sort of this popular notion that it was neutral or even positive. If you look at some of the old cigarette ads from the you know, 40s and 50s, they, they tout cigarettes as a sort of healthy lifestyle choice. But in 1964, the Surgeon General actually wrote a you know, thorough research report that was released to the public that revealed you know, conclusively that cigarette smoke was a huge contributor to lung disease and death. 
And what you can see here on the right is actually the curve of smoking rates in the United States, and the peak is 1964. So when that report was released, you saw an immediate drop in the number of people who, who smoked. So there were some people who right away, as soon as they had that information, said, all right, you know, I, I understand I'm going to stop doing this because it, it's not what I want for myself. And you can see that it still took a number of years, and of course, people still smoke today, but you see right away that, that drop starts. So first of all, the information that you share about an event like this where you need people to make a behavior change that is helpful. Having that truth there, that science there, that is, that is kind of a background that needs to be in place in order for the behaviors to make sense. And so although we know that information is not enough to drive behavior change, I think it's a really critical ingredient that needs to be there. And so I'm really um, looking to the science communicators for the role that they're playing. And um, you know, I think that their work, while not enough in and of itself, it, they need to be there and we need to be supporting them as much as possible. And um, I think individually, too, we can all play a role in helping to spread quality information and not spread low quality information. So um, it may not seem like a big deal, but if you see someone sharing something on Facebook or other social media that you know not to be true, say it. You don't have to be rude about it. You don't have to start a fight. But if you can at least point out these places of misinformation, you may be saving one or two people from that misperception that leads them to make a wrong choice. The other thing that happened with smoking cessation is that society changed, rules changed, and so people were deprived of their choice. Um, I, I lived in two states during the time that they banned smoking in restaurants and bars. So Massachusetts did it when I still lived here years ago, and then I moved to Michigan, and while I was living in Michigan, Michigan did it. So I, I have twice lived in communities that have had to adjust to being able to smoke in bars and restaurants, and then all of a sudden not. And people do resent that, especially at first, but um, they, they adjust to it over time and you see the behaviors change. And more than that, you see the new behaviors normalize and people start to um, coalesce around them. So, you know, I, I think there would probably be protests now if you tried to bring smoking indoors back because so many people have gotten accustomed to the environment of being able to you know, breathe freely in a, in a bar or a restaurant. The other thing you see in terms of public health response for the policy response with cigarette smoking is taxes. That's the lever that the government has to affect people's behavior. And in many states in the United States, this is determined on a state by state level for those of you who don't live in the US. In many states in the US, cigarette taxes are quite high. So in New York, I believe you actually pay more in taxes than you pay for the tobacco product if you go and try to buy cigarettes. So it makes cigarette smoking quite expensive. And as a result, you've seen rates drop except for there's 12 states and they're in a ribbon in the center of the U.S., so it's sort of like Midwestern to Southern states that have the highest smoking rates in the U.S. And if you look at the stats, it's the highest smoking rates by a lot. They, um, you know, probably 15 to 20 percent of the citizens in each of these states smoke. Um, in Tobacco Nation, which is what the Truth Initiative, a nonprofit for smoking cessation, um, has, has dubbed it, a, a person who smokes there smokes 26 more packs of cigarettes per year than the average smoker anywhere else in the U.S. And the taxes tend to be lower there. Cigarettes are 19% cheaper per pack. So it's an example where you see how some of these governmental restrictions, how some of the policy around a behavior can start to affect whether or not people engage in it. And I think that's just something to, to keep in mind as well. So how do we create the conditions for success with this? I think we need to give people space to express these basic psychological needs within the constraints that we put around them. And when I think about the quality of motivation, in general, I try to, how do I find a way to not force somebody to do something? I don't want to create a rule. I don't want to ban something because that tends not to work with motivation. But sometimes if you look at the bigger group, you have to think about those sorts of things. And then the question is, how do I make it feel choiceful underneath that? How do I give people room underneath the rules that I have to impose for the greater good? And so I think, first of all, we need to help people feel like they matter. And I think about, um, you know, those people standing in line on Saturday to get into a bar. And I, I can feel some of their disappointment. I, I know where they're coming from in some ways. And I think that some of what they're thinking is, is anyone thinking about me what I need? Why, am I, why is everyone talking about other people? Why doesn't anyone care what I want? Um, why can't I make my own choices? I'm used to doing what I want to do. Why, why can't I do that now? Um, you know, how can I express myself to the world if I'm forced to sit inside and do things that are not the things that I want to do? And so we need to find room to help people feel like they have some choices and some structure within 
the things that they're being forced to do so that they can have that autonomy, that sense of choice. We also need to feel effective, and that's a really hard challenge with anything like, um, you know, either climate change or the pandemic for different sorts of reasons. But, um, you know, if I do this, is it even going to matter? Is it going to make a difference? Um, do I have any ability to do something that will be helpful? It can be really empowering for people to find ways to be helpful in this. I think one thing I've seen people embrace on social media is something like ordering takeout from a favorite local restaurant and choosing a local restaurant instead of a chain because we recognize that these businesses need support in order to stay afloat long enough to survive all of this. It's a really small thing, but if you feel like you're empowered to make a difference, that can make, you know, that's really helpful. That's really helpful in, um, you know, helping people feel hopeful and helping keep them engaged in doing the right thing. And then the last one, we need to feel connected. This is also a really hard one right now because the particular behaviors we're being asked to do, uh, I mean, we're using the term isolation, social distancing, social isolation. I've seen some folks call for calling it physical distancing instead because we don't want to um, create that, that psychological distance between ourselves. So, you know, one thing that I think is helpful is what is everyone else doing, sharing how you are dealing with your time at home so that other people can feel that, um, that kinship with you and get a glimpse of what you're doing and who you are. Um, figuring out how to maintain interactions over distance. We were talking before about all the different conferencing software we're suddenly using. And, um, you know, I've, I've done some things already this week that I've never done before in order to feel that social contact. And it's, it is helpful to reach out to people, even if it's not the conventional way or the way that I would prefer to do it. And then how can I give and receive affection? I mean, we're, we're, some of us are lucky to have family that we live with so that we're not truly um, solo, but even so, there's ways that we're um, accustomed to showing people we love that we love them, and those are limited right now. So how do we find new ways to reach out and make those connections? And then in terms of where we go from here, I think there's two big things that we need to think about. The first is reducing the harm because this is a really hard time and it is going to do damage to a lot of people. And so we're going to need to pick up the pieces afterwards. Um, I just put, I was looking for news headlines and they're just all over the place. And so I put the scales of justice. Um, but I think we need to think legislatively about how do we um, protect people from the economic effects of this from some of the other effects of this. And I think that's gonna be a very important area um, starting now and going forward. And then here we have an article from The Lancet that just came out. It was a rapid review article. So the researchers recognized the need for this and, and put this together and got it out um, as soon as possible. But the psychological impact of quarantine and how to reduce it. So we know that it is, um, it's hard. It's hard to be quarantined, it's hard to be isolated, and we know that it's going to affect people. And so this article looks at the research to focus on how we limit the negative effects of that. How do we help people come through this in as good a shape as possible? And part of what they conclude is that letting people know that there's meaning in what they're doing. So making sure that they understand that scientific background. This is why it's important. And also helping to show them the effects. I think right now it's too early for this to be the case, but we talk about flattening the curve and we look at those bar graphs of transmission rates in different countries around the world. And I think if we can start to see that staying at home is changing the shape of our graph, that would be a really powerful way to make people feel like their sacrifices right now are worthwhile. And then the second thing that I think we want to try to do is hang on to the gains. And these are three things that made me feel a little bit hopeful. So the first here is a picture of swans in the canals of Venice. And um, if you've ever been to Venice, it is pretty dirty. It, um, you know, the, the water is very murky typically, but there's been all sorts of photographs this week of dolphins and fish and swans and other sea life returning to this water now that people are inside and they're not using it as a, um, you know, a throughway. Realistically, we are not going to never use the streets of Venice again, but I think that this shows us that with just a few weeks of changing the way that, that we, we do it, we can really make a difference in how wildlife is able to use that as well. And so I, I think that's hopeful. I think it shows us that there are small changes we can make perhaps in the future that would help get us smaller versions of this gain. You also see um, at the top here, this is the air quality graph for Southern California. I pulled this last night and um, people in Southern California have been sharing online that this is remarkable that typically any place in this area is going to have unhealthy air quality because of all the motor traffic that they have. And so people there have said they can really feel the difference in their air quality already just from having all those cars off the road. 
And then the bottom, this is the traffic map of Boston. I also pulled this last night around 7 o'clock, which is um, rush hour typically, and you can see all the roads are, are green. Normally, even in the middle of the day, you would see some red or yellow here, but right now everybody's staying home, and so we don't have traffic. And again, I don't think it's realistic to say that we will keep things this austere, and I don't think we want to keep things this austere, but it tells me that we can make some of those smaller changes. We can drive a little bit less. You know, we can take public transportation or walk a little bit more, and it really can have a difference. So for me, these help draw closer that space between the immediate actions that we take and those longer-term climate outcomes that can be hard to see. So I'm trying to draw some hope from that. Um, that's what I put together. I'd love to talk about it and see what other people think. Thank you so much, Amy. So one one uh, one thing that, uh, as you know, sucks with these these webinar type things, and it kind of goes to your point about the social connection. It's very hard to feel the social connection with your audience here. You do have a large audience watching, but you can't hear them uh, applauding. Uh, what I used to do is at least have a little um, applause sound file queued up so that we could pretend that, but but we'll we'll fill in anyway. Um, thank you so much for that. Uh, so we have some questions starting to come in on Slack, which I think you can see as well. Um, yeah. But the good thing about being the host here is I get to jump the queue and ask a couple of my own first. Um, so one thing that's top of my mind at the moment, and it's kind of uh, totally relevant to that paper you were you were showing us a second ago, was uh, the psychological effects on children. Mm. Um, and if there are any specific tips there around how to uh, how to kind of soften that. So that, I'm, I'm sure pa parents on the call have probably already seen plenty of articles about how to talk about this with, with the kids, but just on a day-to-day -day basis, how to lessen their isolation or uh, help them find, you know, that connection that they need. Yeah, um, so I'm neither a child psychologist nor a parent, but... <laughs> Um, I, I will say one thing I've seen and feels like really good advice to me is to not worry so much about duplicating the structure kids are used to. So don't worry about getting them to do schoolwork during all of the hours they'd normally be in a classroom. Um, they, you know, they, they really need maybe an hour or two of that sort of brain nourishment. And the rest of it should be about, um, you know, making them feel reassured, giving them opportunities to be creative and have fun. I think back to, um, you know, things in my own childhood, obviously nothing like this, but times where I think the adults in my life were just stressed about something, um, you know, somebody was really sick or someone had passed away. And one of the things that when I look back that I think was really good as a child is when the adults tried to maintain some sense of normalcy or even fun. So, you know what, like, yeah, things, things are hard right now from the adult perspective, but from the kid perspective, I get to be home and make a tent and, you know, sleep in and wear my pajamas all day. I think trying to make it feel like sort of a special, a special time would be a way to lessen that. Um, I don't know. I would love to hear actually from people who are um, parents or who have more expertise in kids. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, so, so given where we work at the same company, but there's a, uh, there's now a Slack channel. Uh, for everybody who's trying to work and homeschool at the same time, so <laughs> see parents and there, just just a, just this huge live experiment in not only everybody suddenly needing to become an expert in e-learning, but also these kinds of uh, uh, tips to to maintain the sanity. One I saw the other day I really liked was uh, somebody had explained to their kids that it was like they're on a mission to Mars and they're on a spaceship, and they tried to structure their home curriculum as far as it went around. You know, oh, we've got to go to the bio lab and you know watch out for Martians and so on. So um, it, it's very it's very interesting seeing some of these things uh, uh, just sort of emerge from this big experiment. Um, yeah, I, I think I wanted to. Sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say too. Um, I think that one risk right now with us all being at home with our families is um, getting short with each other. You know, getting annoyed by each other. And I'm trying really hard personally not. I don't know what you mean. <laughs> But I, I, um, I think that those things, like if you've seen the, um, there's a Twitter thing going around where it's like, okay, tell, tell a story about something your child did today, but call them your coworker. And it's really funny because it's like, you know, my coworker refuses to wear pants. Those sorts of things are important because they give you an outlet for what might otherwise be frustrating. And I think it's really important right now that we try not to take our own, you know, we try to be kind to each other because this is really hard for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, 
I wanted to just latch on to your final point here about hanging on to games. So Sustainable UX, part of our thing has always been, hey, how can we encourage more remote work? You know, we've always been a remote conference. We want more remote week meetings. We've had speakers on about how to use remote tools. And, you know, we, we were gearing up for more persuasive talks in the future around, hey, why, why, you, why your traditional activities could be more remote? Now, of course, we don't have to um, because people have to do this. So a part of our focus now, or my focus particularly, is trying to come up with ways of doing remote work um, and work remotely that seen as a gain. And, and I, I think people are. A, a lot of people are resenting the quarantine or being stuck at home. But I'm also seeing a lot of people going, oh, wait, you mean I could have worked remote this whole time? This is actually not so bad. And oh, you know, it was just, just work policy that we can do. So it actually turns out it, this is absolutely fine. So uh, just echoing that sentiment that maybe that's one yeah. thing we can do and, away with. And I, I want to add, too, because um, I try to pay attention to the disability community as well, and that's a point that they've been making very clearly, mm. that accommodations they've requested, or, you know, not they, it's not a unitary community, but that people with disabilities have requested in the past and have been denied on are all of a sudden becoming the way work is done. And so I'm hopeful that when this is all over, we have a workplace that is more accommodating of disabled people. That that would be great. And also, you know, just more less um less of a panapt panopticon, right? So you you've got businesses that like to see their their employees busy on the work floor. Um, and that being a potential reason why they didn't want people going remote in the first place. Uh, you know, one, one thing I've, I'm interested in delving into in future is a lot of these remote work platforms are suddenly gaining all kinds of surveillance cap capabilities. I don't, I don't know if you saw that uh, uh, somebody figured out in Zoom that it will, it will now tell the meeting organizer if the people in the meeting are actually goofing off and don't have focus on that, on that window. So, but there's some potentially new harmful behaviors or or uh, power structures that might emerge from all this. But anyway, uh, people are queuing up to ask questions here. So mm -hmm. enough waffle from me. Let's take it to Slack. Uh, folks um, folks listening in, we have a Slack going where, where the Q&A is going on. If you registered in time, then you're in there. Um, I've also posted yeah, a link uh, to sign up to the Slack here yep. in the in the WebEx chat too. Okay, I was gonna say it's not allowing me to post in the chat. Oh, there it is. Okay, never mind. Uh, uh, so, did did you see a question that you or, or already like, or shall I uh, pull one out for you? Yeah, I'm uh, I'm interested in the question here from Shokai, and I I hope I got your name right there. But um, he asked, can you talk a little bit about the conditions that make public response to a pandemic so much more immediate and drastic than climate change, which is arguably killing more people on a daily basis? I think that's a, a really good question. I think um, part of the answer is that it's so it is more immediate and it's harder to obfuscate their relationship. So climate change does not kill people directly. It kills people by um, you know creating conditions under which they are exposed to pollutants that they um, you know become ill. Um, so it's easier for and I'm going to just call them bad actors, but you know people who have uh, an economic interest in <laughs> in denying climate change to pretend that that's not the case. I think with a pandemic, it's so much harder to pretend that it is not the virus killing people. And the time lapse between when somebody is infected and when they um, you know, need hospitalization and when they die, it's, it's, it's much quicker and it's undeniable. So I think it's, it's the immediacy um, that is making the difference, the immediacy in the shorter time period. And I, I also think that, um, you know, if it took longer, we'd probably see some of those same sorts of bad actors who were putting disinformation out there and making people wonder like, well, you know, is coronavirus really hurting people or is it that the circumstances don't permit that, the way that, um, you know, I think climate change has been able to be warped or misrepresented by some people. So I think that's what's going on there. Um, so Kristen asked, oh, I, can, yeah, oh, go ahead. I was going to no, read Kristen's I, question here, um, to your point about empowerment from a healthcare perspective, empowerment is so important in terms of staving off the poor lifestyle choices, which often lead to negative health outcomes. What are your ideas for more systematically empowering greater numbers of people, particularly disenfranchised? Um, that is another great question. And I will say one thing that 
um, I believe it comes from self-determination theory and it, in, it influences the way I do my work is that um, there's something called volitional non-adherence and it's the idea that people have the right to say no to a behavior change. So if, um, you know, they're making lifestyle choices that are leading them to have poor health and that will ultimately shorten their life or reduce their quality of life. And they're doing that um, knowingly, you know, they're choosing it, that is their right to do it. And as a behavior change professional, if someone's in that situation, my response is to step away. You know, I, I basically would say, we have the tools and the support here for you if and when you're ready, but you live your life. And in that case, these are, um, you know, typically people whose behaviors affect themselves. They don't affect the, the group, the community, the society, at least not um, on a large scale the way a pandemic does. Um, when this is all over, I think that one thing that happens is we don't have equality of resources. So there are people who, um, you know, have food, food quality is a really easy example. There are food deserts all throughout the United States and I'm sure globally as well. I just recently did some work um, on the West Coast for a client who was interested in looking at Medicaid and Medicare plan members and how they experience wellness activities. So not healthcare, but wellness, you know, the sort of physical activity, the um, more, you know, eating healthy, the fitness type stuff. And some of the people that we talk to in the research have to take two or three buses to get to different food stores to get all the ingredients for a healthy meal. So they know how to put together, a, you know, a really balanced meal that has lots of fresh stuff and, and low fat and good vitamins and all that. But what it would take to put it on the table is just so much that they, they don't. And if somebody is, um, you know, if they're, if they don't have money, it, they get much more calorically dense food from a McDonald's than from a supermarket. So it's actually a very rational choice for them to go there. One of the things that I hope we see is some sort of improvement of access to resources. I think that right now we're really having that inequality laid bare and laid bare for people who have not realized how bad it is. So as we see people who don't have their normal means of getting things done, um, it, it's really just making the inequality much more visible. I also see in the digital health world some groups who are trying hard to make those tools available to more people. So there's Lisa Gualtieri is here in Boston um, at Tufts University, and she has a group called Recycle Health. So if you have an old Fitbit or fitness monitor or anything like that, she takes those and distributes them to people who don't have the means to purchase them on their own so that they can get involved in fitness type stuff. I think those sorts of groups that are thinking creatively about resources that already exist out in the world and redistributing them to people who can use them have a very important role to play. So I would actually recommend checking her group out, um, Recycle Health. And um, you know, if there are others of those sorts of groups, let's talk about them in the Slack channel because I would love to support them and you know get the word out about them. Oh, and she asked universal basic income. I, I, you know, um, experiments on it have been. So I'm a psychologist, I'm always looking for the data, and um, the data I've seen on UBI has been really positive. It seems like, um, you know, it, it is it is helpful. Um, I think that means testing, and I I don't normally get so political with work stuff, but it's so hard not to with this particular situation in this time. This is um, a safe space, Amy. You can yeah, well, all right. So I'll say, I, right now we're seeing a lot of UBI bills get discussed and proposed, and I think that the means testing aspect of them is bullshit. So, um, you know, if you're going to do a universal basic income, do a universal basic income. I'm fine with it being cut off for people at a certain point, but I saw one bill last night that gets you down to zero if you make $96,000 a year, which, you know, that's not, that's not poverty for sure, but that's also not necessarily um, even middle class, depending on where you live and what kind of debt burden you're under. So, um, you know, I, I think that that's a policy that has a lot of promise. And as I said, the data has shown that typically it, um, it's super helpful to the people who need it. But I worry about our ability as a, at least in the U.S., to implement it in a way that um, that works because we we don't do well with that kind of thing. Um, Conan asked, could we subsidize grocery delivery to recipients of public benefits? Uh, yes, and actually I have seen some organizations that try to do that and have thought of it in different creative ways. So I have seen some health plans that are looking at actually exactly what you said, subsidizing grocery delivery, so making it possible for people to receive um, 
in, in looking in those food desert situations. So especially if you're not living near a grocery store, if you don't have the means to easily get to the grocery store yourself, you might be able to get low or no cost delivery, uh, grocery delivery to your home. I've also seen things like Geisinger Health um, has prescribed healthy food to people. I think their program is mainly for people with diabetes, but that sort of thing is good because it if something is prescribed to you, it can become accessible to you at a lower cost. So that's an example of a health plan basically using the tools and the administration that it has in order to make consumer products more easily available to people. So I think there's a lot of promise there. And I think that if organizations are willing to do it, they have more levers to pull to make it happen than they may realize. Plenty more questions coming in here. I'm going to ask one of my own again, which is, as I, I remember, like maybe, maybe we could call it like the first wave of behavior change getting into the mainstream. I remember many years ago, I was working in e-learning and suddenly the hot topic was gamification. Somebody had read some article and then every boss or publisher or product owner wanted badges and points and suddenly everything had badges and points. And it became one of those things where it was, you know, there was, there was a lot of excitement and very little actual outcome. Um, so what I'm wondering is, you know, what, how do we prevent the next generation of product owners, business owners from, you know, just sort of lazily flipping through the big book of behavior change interventions, picking the thing they, they think might work and, and uh, you know, maybe having no results or, or actually have it risking a backfire type result? Yeah, that's, um, that's a hard question. So one of the things that I run into all the time, and you've, you've seen me struggle with this, I know, is that a lot of behavior change interventions take um, quite a bit of time to be effective. They're not immediate. The exception to this is the behavioral economics toolkit that you see used for things like driving donation, um, you know, driving organ donation sign up or driving 401k enrollment, because those are one-time actions where you can see the effects immediately. A lot of behavior change are these um, focuses on behaviors that need to change for the long term, and then the results take weeks, months, years to show up. And you think about a, a traditional business that's reporting their, um, you know, their, their, um, their quarterly revenues and things like that. I've many times worked with clients, I've been internal to organizations where they've said like, all right, this program's been running for one quarter and we're not seeing a reduction in hospitalization yet. I was like, well, no, you're not. <laughs> we knew that was going to happen. Um, I have a tool that I put together for projects sometimes, um, an outcomes map, an outcomes logic map that actually lays out on a timeline, like here's the results you should expect to see by time. So, you know, at six months, you might see people using the program, you might see them changing their behaviors in the following ways, but you're not necessarily going to see a, re a reduction in hospitalizations until two years out because it takes two years for someone to either get sick or not get sick. And um, one thing that is helpful there, if you have the right audience, is research that proves that point. So, um, I, like one company, when I worked for Health Media, which was acquired by Johnson & Johnson, we were lucky to work with a health plan in Pittsburgh that let us collect eight years' worth of data from their members. Um, and we had a match sample, people who used our programs versus people who did not. And in that eight-year sample, we were able to detect significant differences in how people were using the medical system. But that's eight years. I mean, that, that's a really long time view. So being able to have that research paper and show it to clients and say, listen, you got to hang in there for the long haul if you want to see the results, that was helpful. The other thing that I think is important is having behavior change be more of a specialty and not just, um, you know, something that people think that they can do from a bag of tricks. That might go against a little bit the whole idea that I wrote a book that's success supposed to be accessible to everybody. One of the things I was hoping with the book was that it would basically put the, um, you know, the, the low hanging fruit in people's hands. There's some things that are sort of low risk, easy to do, that I think should be in any designer's toolkit, but then also help people to recognize when something is so complicated that they're better off working with a specialist, with an expert. Um, and we are seeing more of a field around, develop around behavior change design. So I'm part of another community that is specifically behavior change designers and um, we're coming from different backgrounds and working in different types of work environments but trying to create something that's a little bit more of a unified field so that hopefully we can avoid um, you know it, it just being this sort of buzzword that doesn't really have any kind of meaning behind it or any practitioners behind it so we'll see where that goes i did want to actually uh, oh, sorry go on 
Now, one thing that that community has been working on in the last week, um, I would encourage you to visit standagainstcorona.org. So it's just a pledge. It's, um, it's a really easy form. It just asks you to put in your name and your um, location. And it just asks people to take action on four steps. And so what the intention of it was is to make the behavior change we need in the pandemic very clear and very actionable. So, you know, wash your hands, maintain social distance, um, didn't overcomplicate it, but then you can also share it socially. And so part of what the group was trying to do is make it, um, you know, get some social momentum around doing this. So to the point that I mentioned before, like feeling that sense of togetherness. So if you visit standagainstcorona.org, you can see that pledge. Um, and, you know, if you want to sign and share it, they're um, really hoping to get some momentum behind that. Great. We'll post that link into the Slack as well. So um, we're almost out of time. Did you see any other questions in Slack that uh, that caught your eye? There's, a, there's plenty more um, in there. I think we've covered some of this material, but... Yeah, Albert asks, um, what do you think about the fact that behavior change could be used in a way for corporations and government to get rid of their responsibility and put it on the consumers? Um, I think that's a very real concern, and it's one that I share. I, um, you know, I, I don't, I, I, it's, I don't have an easy answer for it because companies are going to do this. Companies already do this. I see Facebook do it. One of the things that Facebook um, consistently says now, because they change their privacy settings all the time and you know, they, they keep getting caught sharing data that people didn't realize they had or didn't realize they were sharing. And their response is always, well, users have the ability to go in and update all of their own settings at any time. And um, that's not a good answer because the average user, I'm, I know how to use technology. I work in technology and I don't know what all those settings are. I don't, um, you know, go in and check those settings on a regular basis to protect myself against them sharing my data. So I think we are seeing corporations do that. And I guess um, my, my mission, my, my concern is to evangelize as much as possible about the ethical use of these techniques and hopefully build up a community of people who are willing to detect these abuses of it, to call them out, to take action against them, um, and you know, to use the, the techniques in a way that, that is ethical. So, um, it's going to happen. It sucks. And I think the best we can do is be aware of it and be vigilant against it. Right. So, um, it, but in sort of more general UXC terms, there's that whole idea of dark patterns and there's a whole shaming movement where UX designers mm -hmm. will call out people using like the sneaky double opt in or the double, you know, and, and that sort of thing. So, yeah. I'm also really interested in algorithm design because we're seeing so many more products that operate with an algorithm as some are part of, um, you know, their behind the scenes logic. And there's a lot, there are several really excellent books out there. So I love Technically Wrong by Sarah Watch Watcher Betcher. Um, mm -hmm. Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks is very good. Weapons of Math Dis Destruction by Kathy Dennis. Um, these, these books are, are, maybe her name is Kathy O'Neill. I'll have to check that. But um, they they basically help you understand how the data that you put into an algorithm affects uh, how they operate on the back end. And when we base our algorithms on false, false data on the front end or data that has been biased by, um, you know, an unjust situation, what comes out the end just reinforces that. So algorithms basically cluster around patterns. And so um, an example that you may have heard of is there's algorithms that are used in um, jail sentencing. So they look at recidivism data. And what happens is historically, black offenders have been punished more harshly, and then they are put into situations that, um, you know, they're, they're policed more, more, um, more brutally. And so the data would suggest that they are more likely to commit a crime again after release from jail, but that data is not, you know, it's based on this very unjust system. It's not, it's not really accurate. It doesn't portray a, a truth. And so what happens is you see, um, you know, black people who are on trial get harsher sentences because of these algorithms that are based on historical injustice. And that's the sort of thing that we also need to be really aware of because it's so tempting to be like, oh, algorithms, that's so shiny, that's so science. Um, no, they're really contextually bound. Right. All right. Uh, the, beware of building in the, the, the bias of the engineer and design team. Uh, what's that other classic industrial design example? Uh, airbags that kill women because all the test dummies were men to begin with and, and that sort of thing. 
Yes, yes. Um, and actually, the author of the, the book, um, I can't think of the name of it right now. I can picture the cover, but she has a newsletter that I would recommend signing up for. I'll throw that in the Slack channel as well, um, where she actually does ongoing, um, she collects examples of gender bias in society. So um, I'll, I'll throw that in as well. It's, it's really eye-opening. Excellent. Okay, so I, we're at about our time and we're about to, to say goodbye to our audience. So I'm just going to share um, one last slide here. Hopefully this is coming up. So um, yep. Amy, thank you so much for, for giving us uh, all this time today, um, particularly under these circumstances where we're all just much more crunched from shifting to, to, to new ways of doing things. Um, so Amy's book is av it's available in all good bookshops. Well, I guess it's available in all good online bookshops. It's, it's, no, it's not. Shop. It's actually available in one good online bookshop, which is Rosenfeld Media and then Amazon, because Rosenfeld Excellent. is a small press. And I, I found through um, this experience that a lot of bookstores and libraries don't actually stock from small presses. So all the more reason to support them. Um, this is, because this is a safe space, we actually have a um, discount code for Rosenfeld Media that is for the Center for Health Experience Design through MadPow. So it's Engage CHXD. If you put that in, it's 20% off the cover price at Rosenfeld. Um, so I would encourage you to buy from them if you're, if you're going to buy it um, rather than Amazon, but it is also available on Amazon. Um, and it's number one you know, on Amazon. <laughs> In industrial design, which it seems like an odd category, but but um, it's such an ego thing. To... They, they pick these like they get to these bizarre tiny categories so that they can tell every author they're number one at something. But you know what? <laughs> I'll take it. Well, industrial design isn't exactly small, and also just just one thing that tickled me looking at that is you're number one, and you're in clear contrast to the number two, which I don't, I don't know what the actual thesis of that book is since it's in German. But it's like manipulation techniques, NLP, how, which I'm, if, if, I'm if I'm taking a, if I can judge a book by its cover, seems to be saying, here's how to trick and manipulate and, and, uh, and fool people to get the behaviors you want. And I think we've all heard, you know, quite clearly, that's not the direction that your book is taking. So, um, you know, uh, it, but, but we have to consider the ethical framework for how we apply these techniques and, and our thinking to it. So very glad to see that. Uh, you know, the crowd agrees and, and is buying your book. Uh, it's vastly outselling the presumably more manipulative <laughs> book. So uh, uh, audience, thank you very much audience for, for tuning in for our, our experiment here. Um, uh, this has been a, a great chat with Amy. Uh, um, part of my reason for doing this selfishly is to have people on the, that have really interesting points of view and good stuff to share and to actually hear hear them talk about it and, and get to ask these questions as well. So again, Amy, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And I'll, um, I'll try to get to some of the other questions in Slack as well. So thank you all. I really appreciate all the engagement. Awesome source. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to un unplug it here. Uh, this recording, if I can figure it out, this recording should appear online um, fairly soon, maybe. Um, thank you all again. Uh, have a great rest of your day. Uh, it's probably been an hour since you wash your hands, so go wash your hands. That's what I'm going to do. I've touched my face five times. I'm doing my own behavior change intervention on myself. Every time I touch my face on video, I have to write it down uh, to try and train myself not to. So there you go. So that's my that's my tiny contribution to uh, right. intervention. So all right. Have a great day, everybody. Take care now. Bye bye. bye, -bye.